Hi, welcome to the Authority Marketing Podcast. I'm Ian Brody, and with me today is Drayton Bird, author of Sales Letters That Sell, a Common Sense Direct and Digital Marketing, and of course, the guy of whom uh, David Ogilvy said no, he knows more about direct marketing than anyone else in the world. Now, I'm about to introduce Drayton, but before I start, Drayton has asked me to say that if you find what you're about to hear interesting, then head on over to www.draytonbirdcommonsense.com. So, as you introduce yourself and say hello, Drayton, would you mind saying why you asked me to say that right up front? Well, first of all, it gives me an excuse to give you the real address, which is <laughs> which is www.draytonbirdcommonsense.com. Uh, uh, yeah. Now, I'll tell you why I'd, I'd ask you to do that, because uh, the one thing that I've learned in, in, over the years is that the most important thing in marketing is to measure everything. And a couple of years ago, a friend of mine in Slovenia said to me that if he makes his offer at the beginning of his presentation, he gets twice as many replies as if he just makes it at the end. <laughs> so that's it, www.drakenbergcommonsense.com, and I will shut up and not try and tell you anything at all. <laughs> well, it's great to have you on the call, and uh, and that's already a little piece of insight for everyone. Get your offer in up front as well as at the end. Um, what what I'd like to ask you first is, uh, as, as I'm sure m most of the people uh, listening to the podcast probably already know you by reputation, and you have established a pretty global reputation, both as a pioneer of direct marketing in kind of the early days, but still continuing that reputation, still being a recognized leader today. Do you mind telling us the story of how you got started in the field? By accident. Uh, well, desperation. I think des I really recommend desperation if you want to succeed. <laughs> um, so I was, uh, way back in when, I was living in a little two up and two up, two up and two down house in Ashton on the line number 174 Catherine Street. Uh, we were the only ones on the row that had a bath. <laughs> so people used to come in and say, can we use your bath, please? <laughs> so I, I had a child, I had a wife, and I had another one on the way, and I had no money. And a friend of mine who was very, very successful and posh and actually belonged to the Princess Margaret set, said to me, you know, you do well in advertising. And I knew nothing about advertising. He was in advertising, he was doing very well. I knew nothing about nothing about it except that it existed and I made my way to Manchester Public Library and read all the books on advertising which took me one evening because there were only three of them it probably gave and you I a thought, significant wow. head start over everyone else though yeah. well I was going to say that people say to me why have you done so well and I also it's not a question of whether I've done well or not the only reason I've done well is because most other people can't be bothered to do what I did mm. um, I started studying and I then took six months to get a job through uh, craven arse licking and uh, general sycophancy. Uh, I took a course, actually an evening course, and then went to the guy who was running it and said, you know, I'm desperate for a job. And I said, oh, I can't really help you, but maybe so-and-so can. I went to see so-and-so, and then so-and-so eventually sent me for an interview. And I got a job, uh, largely because uh, when the guy said, why should I hire you as a copywriter, um, I said, which was true, that I had been writing for a living for two years, and I said I could write. And secondly, I said I was brought up in a pub, which was also true, which teaches you a lot about human nature, which I suspect is rather important mm -hmm. if you want to sell things to people. And thirdly, I have a wide fund of useless knowledge. And he said, well, you mean? He said, so he started asking me trick questions like, can you tell me the difference between the way a two-stroke engine works and a four-stroke engine works? And... It so happens I knew, so he asked me about 10 or 20 questions, and then he said, you do know a lot, I'll give you a job. He said, how much are you getting paid now? And I said, £6.13 and sixpence a week after tax. He said, all right, I'll pay you £6.13 and sixpence a week. So I said, well, the thing is, I live in Ashton, and you're in Liverpool, so it cost me money to come here. Mm. So he said, all right, I'll pay you £9 a week. That gives you an idea what's happened to the value of the pound. So I used to go to this job every day, and then eventually I had a row because at that time I was very, very aggressive um, and obnoxious, to be honest. But I spent all of my time studying, um, and eventually, just before I'm sure they were about to fire me, um, 
I wrote my first direct mail, well, my first direct mail on my own behalf, which was to five agencies in Manchester, and uh, I was offered a job immediately by one of them. And then I, d I was quite successful uh, very quickly. I was doing, I was handling the advertising for, amongst others, Imperial Leather. Um, but I noticed there was a difference between the, the clients that I had, like Imperial Leather, and other clients who were selling things from door to door. Mm -hmm and who were absolutely dependent on results as opposed to running the advertising they liked or their wives liked mm. or whatever. So I started being intrigued by this. And anyhow, once again, I had a row with some of the guy who was employing me in Manchester. And I started looking around for a job in London. And I spent six months going down for interviews and had pretty much a nervous breakdown um, because I kept on turning down jobs. I wanted more money and eventually I got a job paying two and a half times as much money as I was in, in Manchester uh, for doing half as much work and I was still pretty obnoxious I seem to recall but <laughs> eventually after about oh, 14 months I think uh, somebody said would you like to become the copy chief at such and such an agency and it was quite a well known agency called CPV International and I said yes uh, and I went for an interview, and after a lot of argument about how much they were going to pay me, I got a job as a copy chief, which is what they used to have then. They had the art department, the copy department. They didn't work together. Mm. And I started working, trying to get them to work together, and eventually, after a few months, I became the creative director. And then I wrote a long memo to the chairman saying, this is why you should put me on the board, and da 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 and, and he said, calm down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> would be a, bit, a little patient. But at this time, I had generated a tremendous interest in advertising that got response because some of our clients needed it. Um, the British Tourist Office, for instance, British Tourist Association, Greek National Tourist Office, and also a firm that sold washing machines. Um, and I think, one, and, and also a big um, travel business called Blue, Blue Cars, which eventually became Blue Sky and eventually vanished of its own derriere. Um, and I kept on encouraging my clients to try and measure things. And people got to know me quite young. Um, I think I was only about 26 then. And I, I was approached by somebody who said, we've got this product, uh, do you think it could sell? And it was a product, it was a bodybuilding product. And I said, yes. Um, and I left the agency and got involved in direct marketing disastrously because the people I was working for couldn't count and although I did what I said I was going to do for them um, they, they were losing money on everything they sold oh. so eventually I went back into advertising and I got a job in what was then the hottest creative agency in the world just about called Papert, Koenig and Lois um, and I got a job because Charles Sarchi uh, went for the same job but wanted more money than me. Mm -hmm. um, and they chose the wrong guy. <laughs> no question. <laughs> but I was still fascinated with, with this business of direct marketing. And I, and I was still fascinated by advertising. And eventually I went into a consultancy uh, where again I had a row with my partners and walked out with my money and started a little business, a mail order business, which I built up very quickly. I made every possible mistake you can make, and quite a few that very few people would even have thought of. And that bit one, I think in January we were being featured in the Times as the coming businessmen of the year, and in May I was talking to the creditors. <laughs> and I then spent seven years in the wilderness. I, I owed so much money to the tax people that I lived under a false name. And then eventually, uh, after all these this turmoil, I did an awful lot of things for money, which were very good for me, but which I didn't enjoy. I sold on the phone, I sold door to door, I sold franchises, I acted as a marketing director, I wrote speeches, I wrote presentations. I think I've probably done, one thing I would say, I've probably done more, operated in more different areas of marketing than anyone I know, mm. not necessarily successfully, but uh, you learn more from failure than success actually. And eventually I realized the only thing I was actually any good at, which was pointed out to me by somebody else, was, you seem to know more than what I've ever met about this direct marketing business. It's becoming very fashionable. And so I started a business with two partners, 
Uh, none of us had any money, and as I say, I owed a lot of money. I owed 10,000 pounds, which in 1977, believe me, was a hell of a lot of money. Um, and within three and a half years, we were the biggest strip marketing agency in the country, and then my two partners left for one reason or another, probably me. Um, and I sold the business through Ogilvy and May, because by that time we were the largest strip marketing agency outside America. Mm. So I sold the business to Ogilvy and Mather, and then I was very lucky that I got on well with, with David Ogilvy, which is probably why he said that nice thing mm. about me. Um, and I, I went onto the worldwide board of the Ogilvy Group, um, and, that, and I wrote the, these books along the way. Mm. So that's pretty much a quick, I'm afraid it's a bit long, but that's pretty much an answer to your question. Well, you have, you have lived a life. You have lived a life. There was a lot to go through. So th there's a couple of interesting things have come out as, as you've talked, because um, over the years, you, you've, you've obviously done an awful lot of different things, obviously co copyright and direct marketing, but a whole series of marketing and selling type things. You've built businesses, you've managed businesses, you were on the board of Ogilvy and Mather. Um, now, what you do nowadays is as well as having your own clients that you do um, direct and, and other marketing for, of course you train others, you provide consultancy uh, in how to do direct marketing. Um, at what point did you decide that as well as, and, and you mentioned that you'd done these books as you went through your career, at what point did you decide that as well as doing direct marketing, you'd also like to kind of teach it and train others in it? It wasn't that decision at all. What it was, was that when we started our agency, I formed the view, and I think that the kind of business you run is based on the kind of person you, mm -hmm. you are. So the kind of person I was, was that I was a great student right from the start, and, and I thought that the, the, the business would succeed if you knew more than anyone else. Effectively, if you know more than anyone else, you're in a better position to advise clients. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're running a business, it's no use you knowing everything. You have to try and make sure that you train other people. Mm -hmm. That was one reason why I started doing it, to train other people. The other reason was that um, I had said right at the very beginning when we started the business, I said to my partners who were both younger than me, I said, look, this is probably a wonderful adventure for you, but for me it's a matter of life and bloody death. You know, I've got mm -hmm. no money. I've got to make money now, I was 40, I think. Um, so if I have to walk up and down Bond Street strangling people, that's what I'll do. <laughs> and then I was asked to do this speech to 120 <laughs> publishers, and I said, oh, no, I don't want to do that. And my partner said, look, you're the person who said you would walk up and down Bond Street, etc." And I said, well, look, the only time I ever stood up in public and made a speech was at somebody's wedding, and I made a complete idiot of myself, and it's the most humiliating experience I've ever had. And I'm never doing it again. And they said, you'd better do it. And I did it, and I, I had to take, I can remember clearly, I had to take two large brandies and a tranquilizer uh, to be able to do it. I didn't remember anything about what I'd said. <laughs> and at the end, I said to somebody, was I any good? And they said, yes. And I said, why? And they said, because you knew what you were talking about. Mm. And I used to have go through the most appalling, I mean, and everyone knows that public speaking is a dreadful experience. And I still feel very nervous, although I've done it what, in 51 countries now. still feel nervous, although if you're not nervous, you're not any good. But so, so it was partly a desire to promote the business, you know. Mm. So once I'd realized I wasn't actually going to die on the podium, so to speak, um, I would offer to speak to anybody, anywhere, about anything. And then eventually, I was asked by a man who was actually the best copywriter in the world at that time, a guy called Bill Jamie, mm. uh, to speak in Monte Carlo, and then in Los Angeles, and then someone asked me to speak in Manila. And then the Australians asked me to go out there, and I agreed in a moment of folly um, <laughs> to, to do a series of one-day seminars. And then eventually, I got it up to two days, and finally three days. Boy, can I bullshit for England. Um, so, I, I, and the thing is that it's like a virtuous circle. Doing the job feeds uh, teaching people or mm. talking about it. What a lot of people do in business generally is they just don't study. You know, they don't. They don't study. Uh, 
the background to what they're doing. In other words, for instance, to give you a good example, I had a student in yesterday uh, from from America, and he'd, he'd been sent by somebody I knew, so I would I talk to him? So I, I spoke to him for about half an hour. And I said to him, you know, the problem with, if you want to know how to succeed, the first thing you have to decide is, is what you want to do. Do you know what you want to do? And he didn't really. Mm. I said, well, unless you know what you want to do, you're, not, you're going to be in trouble. And even when you've decided that you know what you want to do, you're almost certainly going to be in trouble unless you're prepared to give up something to do what you want to do. Um, and if you even then you're going to probably be in trouble because most people talk about doing things but don't do them. But it all starts with study. I mean, you can't. My good fortune was as a friend said to me, try advertising, and I went and studied. Yeah. And I immediately saw, hey, this is for me. Um, and then once I'd started doing that, I read everything I could get my little hands on on advertising. Um, and then I realized, of course, that advertising was only part of the business, um, you know, the whole business of business. So I started studying business. In fact, I was writing yesterday, I think in my blog. No, I'm not sure. Because um, I write every day. Um, I was writing about a book that influenced me greatly, which was uh, Alfred P. Sloan's book, My Years mm, in General, General Motors, Motors yeah. um, which is a terrific book if you want to understand business. Mm. But most people just Most people just go along merrily on their way, uh, relying on good luck, contacts, charm, this, that, and the other. Talent, you know, talent it helps, but, you know, it helps a lot more if you know why you're doing what you're doing. And it, in fact, I was quite amused. Um, last year, I was close, I had went to speak in Florida. Um, they gave me this award for lifetime achievement, and I thought, what can I say? You know, they would we'd like you to make a small, short speech. So I said, well, I, I think, you know, this is rather like being a, giving an award for being a good plumber. I said, it's not really a terribly difficult thing to do. But to be honest, uh, uh, the, the award doesn't belong to me. It belongs to all the people who don't bother to study and that will make fools like me look pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's not, it really isn't that you're any good yourself. It is that you... You study and you think about what you're doing and you, if you're trying to teach people, you use what you're doing every day to inform people. Mm. And the thing that will inform you and people most is your mistakes. So, so you've got a, you've got in there, you've got a combination of, if, if you want to establish yourself as an authority and expert in your field, the most important part is to become one through study and through learning from your mistakes and measuring what you're doing. And well, yeah, there is a thing, there's a thing that, um, I, when I used to speak to new recruits um, at Ogilvy and Mather, I used to say, I advise you to become a generalist and be an expert. And, and by that I meant, well, you must understand the general context of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's, I think I quote in one of my books, the old British Army song, you'll, we're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. So you go to the office every day and you go into the office. Why? Because you're going into the office because you're being paid. If you don't step back and become a, have a general perception of why you're doing what you're doing, you're not going to do very well. And then in order to be known for something, I always joke about this, but I'm serious in a way, um, you, I always say, look, find something that's so bloody obscure that nobody's bothered to study it. <laughs> <laughs> in my case, it was drug marketing. Well, what happened was that I read, I read everything I could about drug marketing, and uh, I couldn't find a simple definition of it. And, and I remembered from my early studies of advertising that in 1904, uh, somebody finally came up with a good definition, which was, at that time was advertising is salesmanship yeah. in print. And um, I thought, I was looked everywhere. The, the, sh the only definition I could find of direct marketing was a one and a half page chart in an American magazine, which I didn't understand. And I thought, it must be simple, yeah? So I thought, where do I start? Um, and it took me this because simplifying things is very difficult, you know. Yeah. So I, I started by saying, "Okay, what is business all about? Business is all about is not about making profit. It's about customers. That's where the money comes from. So business is about making and keeping customers. What is direct marketing all about? It's about making and keeping customers as individuals, putting them on a database, and being able to measure the results of what you do." and build a long-term relationship with them because 
in any in any business, you are very unlikely to make much money on the first sale. Mm. So you've got to make more than one sale. Yeah. So I, I then sort of managed to work out, if you like, a general theory of direct marketing, and wrote it down in 1982. And nobody was more surprised than I was when people said, hey, this is a great book. And it's now, I mean, well, it's been the bestseller in this country, which means it probably sells about four copies a year, ever since 1982. And it's out in 17 languages. It's quite funny, actually. There's somebody in Bulgaria negotiating with me, saying, oh, can we publish your book? And I keep on writing to them, saying, it's already been published in Bulgaria. Oh, no, it hasn't. I said, well, what are these five books on my shelves in Bulgaria? I said, I'm not a Bulgarian, isn't very good, but... It's been published in Bulgaria. And it's, well, not enough, so it's going to be republished in <laughs> Bulgaria. <laughs> well, it'll be read by five people. So in terms of in terms of you establishing this global reputation you have, you talked a lot about, you did a lot of speaking. You obviously, you had mm. your books. I think what, one of the things I noticed as we were talking was you, you also had a, a very strong point of view about certain things and, uh, mm. and weren't, afraid, weren't afraid to share that with people, whether they agreed with you or not. So, I mean, what, what, of all those things, what, what would you say were the things that probably most built your reputation for you in direct marketing? Mm. Um, not boring people. Mm. Uh, or possibly um, simplifying things, or possibly being controversial. Um, all, of which are, all of which are related, because none of those are boring. Yeah, I don't think, well, my old boss David used to say, you can't bore people into buying, you can't bore people into learning. I always thought, I was actually, again, I was talking to this young man <coughs> who's not sure what he wants to do. And I said, well, he, he said, oh, I think I want to be creative. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he couldn't even decide whether he wants to be a writer or a, an art director or whatever. And I said, well, you better find something that you love, mm. that you want to do. Um... But then I said, look, I don't really care what you are going to do. Um, I don't care whether you want to write something or you want to paint something or you want to compose. And if suppose, assuming you want to write, I don't care whether you want to write speeches or you want to write presentations or you want to write advertisements or you want to write books. Um, whatever you're trying to do in any artistic medium whatsoever, yeah, be it commercial or otherwise, depends first and foremost upon finding something that seizes people's attention and makes them want to know more. And I don't care whether it's the first three notes in a composition or the initial impact of a painting or an installation uh, or the start of a film or a commercial. To me, it's all the same. In fact, the older I get, the more... I think that there are general laws that apply to all these things, mm. which is something that's only just occurred to me, by the by. I was going to say, you, you're kind of applying... <laughs> I put it that way before. You're kind of applying <laughs> AIDA to, uh, to, to art there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Very you interesting. You must gain attention. Yeah. You must gain attention. And, and, must uh, gain attention. And as you said, as you said earlier, the, the, um, also find something you have a, you, you can love because without that, you're not going to push yourself to do the study and to, to keep on trying and to make mistakes and keep on going. Oh, yeah, I think, I think the saddest thing in the world, um, or one of the saddest things in the world, certainly in terms of the, what people do for a living, is that I imagine the majority do things that they don't actually enjoy doing, and I think it's a terrible thing to go into wherever you work and do something you don't enjoy doing. If you don't enjoy doing it, try and do something else and this is an easily said um, and of course your ability to choose what you do is determined to a great degree uh, by the de how well educated you are or how well you educate yourself and I think one of the great tragedies of our society is the, the you know decline in education but that's another subject mm. So, Drayton, if you if you were talking, I suppose a bit like you were to uh, the the other day to this uh, young guy who came to see you, and you you're talking to say uh, someone who's, who's a consultant or an advisor, some kind of professional, and they wanted to make a name for themselves in their field. They wanted to become known as a as a real expert that people would 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 you know they'd be the first person people would call for that particular area. What would your what would your advice 
to them be? Where should they start to build that reputation and position? I think the process um, involved in this is the same as the process involved, strangely enough, uh, in any artistic activity. Um, there is a very good book uh, called A Technique for Getting Ideas by a former creative director of J. Walter Thompson in Chicago called James Webb Young, in which he analysed the way in which uh, great painters and artists and so on and writers got their, their ideas. <coughs> and what they used to do was, uh, first of all, they would, they would, so to speak, do their research and their sort of preliminary thinking. They would mm. scribble things down. They would, uh, you know, make notes of anything that occurred to them and so on and so on. And so... And then they would then then they would allow their minds uh, to run fallow and let their subconscious work on on the problem and uh, and see what they came up with. And I think if I were looking at um, becoming an expert in anything, uh, I would go through very much the same process. I would say, okay, this is what I mean. Obviously, computers is remark. You know, find something. Uh, to do that you love and then you'll never do a day's work in your life applies but, but assuming you found something that really really interests you it must interest you you know otherwise it's a waste of time yeah. then the next thing you have to do is to do the analogous thing to what the composer or writer would do do your research so you study every single aspect of it as much as you can uh, and every single aspect of the context in which it operates so for instance when I was talking about direct marketing I realised that I had to study the context of drug marketing, which is business, yeah? Mm. So so you have to do that. You have to study the context of what it is you're interested in doing. And if you do it with sufficient attention to detail and with sufficient thought, uh, you should be able to find something that somebody has not bothered to cover or that somebody has not bothered to explain so that you can come along to people uh, with a point of view or something that you've got something to say yeah? mm. um, if you look at books like Blink for instance yeah. um, which deal with things like decision making uh, all these books really revolve around some some subject you know <laughs> you've got to find a subject that interests you and really study it and as you say there's and a bit of a gap you begin there. to come to a point of view yeah. yeah, and then and then and then don't just don't just provide a summary, but create a point of view that people haven't heard yeah. before that will make you stand out. Make people, I mean, challenge challenge dogma if necessary. Stay. Mm. I mean, the the create this is a creative process. You know, when people talk about, oh, I'd like to be a consultant. But a bloke actually wrote to me yesterday and said, I'd like to be, I've read this book, I'd like to be a consultant. I really, it was all I could do, not to write back and say, are you fucking kidding me? You know. <laughs> I mean, it's just a joke. Uh, um, one book. <coughs> Excuse yeah, me, I'm, I'm I mean, coughing here. <laughs> you don't. I mean, the one thing I would say is that I probably, I really do probably know more about this subject. I know, I certainly know I'm more, uh, more about direct marketing than anyone I've met. And I probably know more about marketing than most people. Hmm. Than just about anybody I've met because I've done so many things, but very often badly. But, um, but it's knowledge. As I was saying to my young friend yesterday, I always remember what Francis Bacon said, that knowledge itself is power. If you're the person who goes into the room, who knows more than anyone else? Or, and if on top of that you go into the room and you have a point of view as well, uh, you're going to be in a room full of people who haven't made their minds up and don't know what they're talking yeah. about. It's a wonderful state of affairs. Yeah. <laughs> so ex exactly how you communicate and things like that, not, not as important as actually having knowledge other people don't have and a point of view on it. Well, I think how you communicate is equally important. But, I mean, it's rather like <laughs> What's more important, having a good product or, or good advertising? Yeah, yeah you need it is both. More yeah. important, you can have a. If you've got a great product, you don't need great advertising. But if you've got a great product and great advertising, yeah. then you're away. So if and you've got a great it. idea on what you want to be as a consultant, uh, and then you could, you've studied how to communicate that idea, and you spend all your time thinking about it, you'll do better. I mean, I was quite, I was quite amused. A friend of mine told me yesterday that. Somebody I know is charging people £25,000 to become consultants. Well, you won't become a consultant by 
paying twenty five thousand pounds. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, it's not that simple. You don't use it. Oh, I'd like to be a consultant. Here's twenty five grand. You know, so it's not you. like buying a bloody laundrette or a, a McDonald's franchise. <laughs> not really. <laughs> well, hopefully yeah. not, but. Yeah. That has been fantastic. That's been really useful. Thank you very much for that. Um, My pleasure. And to repeat what you said at the start, if people want to find out even more, uh, where should they head to? Well, what you can do, uh, what you can get two things if you want to find out even more. You can get what. If you do go to this site, uh, you will be able to download absolutely free the best book ever written on marketing and advertising, which is just 48 pages long. So that's a relief for you. It's also the oldest book that I know of of any merit. Um, it's called Scientific Advertising. Uh, the site is www.drakenburgcommonsense.com. And at the same time, you can register to get... Uh, a series of helpful marketing ideas which go out to something like 12,000 people around the world every week, uh, twice a week. Uh, quite a few millionaires get them and at least one billionaire. Um, they're very, very short. Most of them are funny. If you like the sort of rubbish I've talk, well, you'll like them. And if you want to know a little bit more about business, you'll like them too. So that's www.drayton.com and thanks for for interviewing me and thanks for the three of you who are still listening <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real pleasure Drayton thank you very much <laughs> my pleasure <Ian>. cheers <laughs> bye bye bye